This morning we are concluding our series entitled Stuffed, uh, looking at things that can compromise our faith in Christ uh, if we are stuffed with them. And in this series we've been challenging ourselves to give up those things, uh, take some of those things out of our lives in order to make room for God to fill us with what he desires in us. Uh, Week one, we saw that we are stuffed with our stuff. Um, and we were challenged to let go of some of our stuff so that God could fill us with generosity. Uh, week two, Brett talked about how we can be stuffed with grudges, and we were challenged to let go of some of our grudges so that God could fill us with peace. Last week, the topic was being stuffed with ourselves, and the challenge was to be focused more on others and less on ourselves. We just need to do some personal house cleaning in order to create space for God to be at work in us. Uh, One of our new directives is transformed lives where we live visibly different lives because of our faith in Jesus. And that requires doing an inventory of our lives, discerning what in our lives we need to part with, discerning what God calls us to incorporate more of into our lives. And this morning we're going to consider how much we are stuffed with pleasure. From the beginning, humanity has been on a pursuit of pleasure. And sometimes the things that bring us pleasure, while it doesn't necessarily conflict with what is pleasing to God, but sometimes what we enjoy does conflict with what God wants. And the challenge is to give up certain pleasures to ensure that what is pleasing to us is also pleasing to God. The scripture for this morning comes from Esther chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Uh, You can turn there in your Bibles. Uh, Esther's in the Old Testament. It's two books before the book of Psalms. Uh, You can also look it up on your phones. Um, Esther just happens to be Uh, the basis for the Jewish holiday of Purim, which is going to occur just in the next couple weeks, like in the middle um, of March. Now, Esther um, takes place about 480 years uh, before Jesus, um, during the time of the Persian Empire. And the Persian Empire has just gotten a new king, King Xerxes. And the passage is about the beginning of his reign. Our scripture reader this morning is John Wright. So John, uh, please make your way on up to the podium. As he does, I'm going to ask if you're able to please stand and face the middle of the room. We uh, read from the middle of the room to remind us that scripture is to be central in our lives. And we stand because we believe this is the word of God. And so John, whenever you're ready, please read from Esther chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all the nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. John, thank you very much. You may be seated. Uh, When I was in attending community college in Southern California, I was introduced to a college Bible study. It was led by uh, Shannon's parents. We weren't dating at the time, uh, but there were about six of us in the group. And I was relatively new to the group, and I wanted to make 
a good early impression. And uh, one particular week at the study, uh, we were outside um, at Shannon's parents' house, and we were outside on the back deck um, near the pool, and we were just kind of sitting around the table eating, and a Japanese beetle started flying over the middle of the table. Now, Japanese beetles are really, they're big insects, like the size of a quarter. You know, when they're flying around, um, they look kind of intimidating. And even though they look intimidating, they are completely harmless. I have many times seen people uh, just grab a Japanese beetle out of midair as it's flying and just grab it, open its hand, and it won't do anything. They are completely harmless. They do not bite. So I'm thinking, how cool would it look if I grabbed this Japanese beetle out of the air? Um, now, one important detail is we had just got done swimming and I wore glasses, but I was not wearing my glasses at the time because we just got done swimming. So I didn't have my glasses on. I see this Japanese beetle flying over the middle of the table and I grab the Japanese beetle out of the air. Except it wasn't a Japanese beetle. <laughs> uh, I found out very quickly that it was one of those fat bumblebees. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it stung the dickens out of my hand. It hurt like crazy. So I yelled in pain, threw the bee out of my hand. Um, they got me some ice because my hand started to swell up. Um, and then everyone asked me, why did you grab that bumblebee? And I sheepishly just answered, well, I thought it was a Japanese beetle. And then everyone told me to put my glasses back on. So, so much for making a good first impression. Now, King Xerxes is the new king of the Persian Empire. The empire has 127 provinces. It stretches from India to modern-day Egypt. Uh, here's a map of the empire. It is huge. Persian Empire was huge. Now, as awesome as it would be to be the king over such a vast empire, Xerxes got, has a major issue that he needs to overcome. He needs to keep this kingdom united. He has to convince the leaders from the 127 provinces that he is fit to rule, that they shouldn't try to rebel. And just to kind of compare, the United States, we have 50 states, and we struggle sometimes to keep everyone together. Um, this is 127 provinces, and he has to demonstrate that he is fit to rule and they should not try to rebel. This is a vital moment in his rule as king. So, his strategy for convincing everyone um, is to impress the people by appealing for their desire for pleasure. There is this power of pleasure. And there are times that we will sacrifice anything for pleasure. And Xerxes is going to convince the nobles that he is fit to be king by showing how much pleasure he can provide for them. He knows that there is power in pleasure and that by demonstrating his own power and appealing to their pride and their passions, he can maintain the power. We will sacrifice anything for pleasure. In the parable of the sower, Jesus says, the seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. In this parable, the seed represents the word of God that can give life, but life's worries and riches and pleasures choke out the life of the power of God's word. And again, pleasure in itself is not bad, but when it is our king, we will sacrifice anything for it, and that leads us to all sorts of bad places. There is a pursuit of pleasure, and in our pursuit of pleasure, we must be mindful of the power it can have over us. King Xerxes appeals to three different sources of pleasures for us. And I just want to unpack each one, beginning with status. Status. Going back to the passage, verses 2 to 4. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, 
he gave a banquet for all of his nobles and officials. The military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present for a full 180 days. He displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. This was an exclusive event. Xerxes doesn't just invite anyone. He only invites the who's who of the kingdom, the military leaders, the princes, the nobles. He invites them to the capital city. This is an event for the elites. Now, I've never been invited to a state dinner by either the president or governor or anything like that. I've never attended uh, the Oscars or the Grammys. But there is something about being a part of the exclusive, where we are made to feel special, like we are better than everyone else. It appeals to our pride. It brings pleasure. Having a certain status brings a sense of pride, makes us feel important, and feeling important makes us feel good. It's a source of pleasure. It's all about status. And when the king only invites the upper class, he appeals to their pride. King Xerxes, he appeals to status. He also appeals to splendor. In verse 6, where it says, The garden had hangings of white and blue linen, fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of potpourri, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. The garden was exceedingly beautiful. And we find pleasure in beauty. Uh, we find pleasure in the beauty of nature. Whenever someone uh, comes to town who's new, where either friend or family or some visitor comes, where do we take them? Where do we show them? Well, we take them to the beauty of the canyon, or we take them to see the beauty of the falls, at least, you know, when the water's mostly running. I personally love the beauty of the ocean. I can watch the ocean for hours. Now, I'm not going to go in the ocean because I have an irrational fear of sharks, but I love the beauty of the ocean, the beauty of nature. But we also love the beauty of just man-made structures and monuments, whether it's things like the Golden Gate Bridge or the Eiffel Tower or the Sydney Opera House. King Xerxes displays the beauty of the garden he created. Um, there are people that we find beautiful. And whatever that may look like for us, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but we like looking at beautiful people. Now, later in the chapter, King Xerxes is going to ask the queen, Vashti, to come and display her beauty. And Vashti will refuse, which is where the story takes a major left turn. But again, we like to see beautiful people. And so whether it's nature or man-made monuments or people, we find pleasure in beauty. And so King Xerxes, he appeals to status, splendor, and he appeals to the senses. Going back to the passage in verse 5 where it says, When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. Jumping down to verse 7. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. The king holds a banquet for his exclusive guests in his beautiful garden. And there was wine served in golden goblets, and each goblet was individually made. No two were alike. And by the king's command, there were no restrictions on how much people could drink. Now, just want to point something out. When the king makes a command, that becomes law. 
That becomes law. And the king's law is to have a no limit host bar. <laughs> however, someone, however much someone wanted to drink, that's what they got. The king's command is in essence a drinking law. And the drinking law is drink as much as you want. That's a weird drinking law. Our drinking laws put limits on drinking, where you have to be a certain age to drink. You can't drink and drive. You can't sell alcohol without a certain license. In Idaho, you have to buy liquor from special liquor stores. All these laws exist to curb alcohol use and abuse because people like to drink. And people like it so much that they will put themselves and others in danger if there are no legal boundaries. Now, King Xerxes' law takes advantage of people finding pleasure in drinking. And he commands, let them drink as much as they want. Look, I'm trying to unify my kingdom here. Help me out. Drinking makes us feel good. But it's not just drinking that's a part of this banquet. It's eating too. He holds a seven-day banquet. And we do like to eat. And we like to eat things that taste good. Eating things that taste good make us feel good. It's another source of pleasure. Personally, I'm a sucker for filet mignon, lobster, and cheesecake. All right? I also like Fritos, Doritos, Cheetos, okay? All right, I'm all over the spectrum. I also like that fake cheese that comes in a can. I like putting that on saltine crackers. I find that to be good too. We like to eat. So King Xerxes, he appeals to status, splendor, and to the senses. Now think about all of the things that you like, the things that bring you pleasure. If you were to list them out, I bet you could fit all of them under one of these three categories. The things that bring you pleasure either have something to do with your status or splendor or things to do with your senses. I bet you all the things you find pleasure in fall in the category of status, splendor, or senses. And do we know when something that is pleasing to us is not pleasing to God. Do we even know that? Do we even pay attention to that? See, there are some things that are pleasing to us that are not pleasing to God. And there are some things that are pleasing to us that are pleasing to God. But it's a never-ending temptation, this pleasing to us versus pleasing to God struggle. It's a never-ending temptation for us to do what is pleasing to us, whether God likes it or not. Sometimes we just don't care. I'm going to do what I like. Now, humanity has been pursuing pleasure from the beginning. And so I would like for us to go back to the beginning, back to the first temptation, where we go to the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where Adam and Eve eat from the tree that God commands them not to eat from. Why would they do that? Well, let's go back and to the story because it tells us why they do that. Genesis 3, uh, beginning in verse 5, and it begins with the end of the serpent statement. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. So the passage gives three reasons for eating from the tree. Reason number one, the fruit of the tree was good for food, which meant it tastes good. It appeals to the senses. We like things that taste good. Remember the seven-day banquet of King Xerxes, and remember his command, let them drink as much as they want. So reason number one, it was good for food. Reason number two is the fruit of the tree was pleasing to the eye, which meant it looked good. It appealed to our sense of beauty. We like things that look good. And remember the splendor of King Xerxes, the purple and white hangings, the couches of gold and silver, the pavement of marble, pearl, and other costly stones. So the fruit of the tree was pleasing to the eye. 
And reason number three, the fruit of the tree, will make us wise. It'll make us like God, which meant it will raise your status. You will be wise like God. We like being important, being more important than everyone else. Remember the exclusive banquet where only the nobles and princes and military leaders were able to attend. Who has a higher status than God? We could be like God. We have been pursuing pleasure from the beginning, whether or not it is pleasing to God. We are stuffed with pleasure. It consumes our lives. Again, pleasure by itself is not wrong. But we need to at least ask if our pleasures are pleasing to God. Matthew 23, in Matthew 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. There are a lot of things that please God. Don't have time to cover them all, but this is a good place to start. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. Justice is doing what is right. Mercy is expressed in compassion and forgiveness. Faithfulness is remaining loyal. And the good news is that these are the things that bring God pleasure. And that is good news because it brings God pleasure to do what is right for us. God likes to practice compassion and forgiveness. God's, it is God's pleasure to remain loyal to us. How much pleasure do we experience in justice, mercy, and faithfulness? At the very least, let's keep the following question in front of us. Are you aware when your desires are in conflict with God's desires? They won't always be, but are you aware when they are? It brings God, it brings God pleasure to do what is right, to practice compassion and forgiveness, and to be loyal. Please pray with me. And Lord, we come before you grateful and thankful for the fact that you are a God of justice, mercy, mercy, and faithfulness. And Lord, I would ask that your spirit would bring to mind ways that um, the things that bring us pleasure are in conflict with what brings you pleasure. And Lord, that uh, you would change our hearts and that we would find more pleasure in things like justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Lord, we thank you for um, your compassion and forgiveness when we fall short. And it's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Receive God's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.